Amen. Y'all let them know how much you appreciate them leading us in worship this morning. Always blessed by them. Listen, I want to invite you to open your Bible, if you will, to John's Gospel, Chapter 1. John, Chapter 1. And as you're opening up your Bibles there, I was pretty impressed as I was uh, in preparation for this particular message at how many articles you can find on Christmas, not only in the newspaper, but also online. And a few of those articles that I ran across had pretty interesting titles. Most of them were kind of lined up to be self-help ideas. And so let me just kind of ask you, I'm going to read you the title of these particular uh, articles. You tell me if you wish that you would have an opportunity to read that. And you're going to do that by a lifted hand. Y'all with me? Say yes. So here, here's the very first one that I ran across. Five ways not to stress out this Christmas. Anybody need to read that article? Just slip your hand up. God bless you. You all are truthful people. Blessings upon you, liars. But anyway, so... I'm just kidding. Here, here's another one. The other one was, uh, how about this one? How to stay slim this Christmas. <laughs> Look at y'all. Y'all don't want to raise your hand, do you? All right, yeah, yeah, that's right. Here's another one. Uh, how to get the perfect gift this year. Anybody look that one up? I did. I looked that one up. I was uh, looking for my wife and did not find anything. And uh, here, here's another one. All right, four tricks to get away from your in-laws this Christmas. Do you slip your hand up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I actually wrote that article. But anyway, so... Uh, just kidding. One that I did run across that I kind of uh, enjoyed and thought, okay, I'm going to read this from the full length, all right? This one was entitled, uh, 10 Ways to Make This the Very Best Christmas Ever. And I thought, all right, I want, you know, this Christmas to do the best, so let, give me 10 ways I can do it. So let me kind of give you the list very quickly. Number one, they said, enjoy the buildup and the anticipation. Number two, they said, watch a Christmas movie. Number three, they said, read a Christmas book. The suggested book was A Christmas Carol. Number four, they said, shop online. Number five, they said, write a letter to Santa Claus. Number six, they said, make a gingerbread house. Number seven, and I like this one. I said seven, very country. Did y'all hear that? Number seven, they said, build a Christmas tree out of biscuits. Somebody say amen on that, right? Poor little honey. I mean, I had all kinds of visions in my mind. Number eight, start a new Christmas tradition. Number nine, get the best wrapped present award. And then number 10, visit the most decorated house in your area. Now, as I read through those 10, I, I noticed something uh, that really should have been on the list but was not on the list. Nowhere on the list of how to make this your best Christmas ever was there any inclination or statement about the Lord Jesus Christ. Did y'all notice that as I read that? You're thinking that has nothing to do with Jesus. You're exactly right. As a matter of fact, uh, what we know about our culture is that our culture every single year consistently seeks to push Jesus out of Christmas. Matter of fact, Christmas has become so commercialized that the message of the Lord Jesus Christ often gets drowned out. And that being the case, what I want us to do this morning is really make up in our minds as Concordians that we are going to make the most out of this Christmas. Christmas season. We're going to squeeze the very most out of it that we possibly can. But in order for us to do that, we've got to have some very practical uh, steps that we can take so that we can get the very best out of Christmas to this year. So let me just ask you, you want to get the best out of Christmas? Say amen. All right, so I'm going to give you two practical steps out of John's gospel so that you, as well as your family, can get the very most out of Christmas this year. Now, John's gospel is written by John the Apostle, and it's a pretty awesome gospel as you read through it because John really has this desire desire to let everybody know that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. And he comes right out of the gate doing that in John's Gospel chapter 1. But I want us to focus our attention on verses 14 and 15. So if you got your Bibles there, if you'll stand with me in honor of God's Word this morning, we're going to see two steps to make the most out of Christmas, all right? John 1 verse 14, you got it there in front of you, say amen. Now the Bible says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received in grace upon grace. And then let me just read 17 and 18 as well. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. Jesus has explained him to us. Let's bow together. Father, we are so thankful for your divine word and just an opportunity once again to be reminded 
today about what Christmas is all about. And Lord, I know for my family, I want us to really get the most out of this Christmas season that we possibly can. So Lord, the practical steps that you've taught me, help me deliver them today so that they will be a help to every single person who's in the house. And God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would speak to those hearts who are present who have not yet received the gift of Jesus Christ by faith. And Lord, use the message today just to stir their hearts and draw them to salvation. And we'll give you glory for that. Father, I just pray that you would fill me with your spirit. Allow me to speak what you desire to be spoken. And may you be glorified in every single thing that is done through the message. And that's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. So go ahead and be seated this morning. All right, so two steps. You want to jot them down in your listening guide this morning. The very first step is pretty simple. It's just I need to meditate on the miracle. I need to meditate on the miracle. And I'll tell you, last night I shared this with uh, our family, right? So we were sitting down eating supper. And uh, it was our devotion time. I said, let me just kind of read a little bit of what I'm going to preach tomorrow. You guys help me out, right? Let me know if this makes sense. And so I got to the uh, meditate on the miracle. And Miss Maddie Skipper, who's our oldest daughter, looks at me and says, that makes no sense. I said, what do you mean it makes no sense? Do you want us to sit crisscross applesauce and throw our hands out and say, hmm? And uh, anyway, we removed her from the table. She didn't finish her meal. That's not what I'm talking about. When I talk about this idea of meditating on the miracle, it means to ponder or to think about the miracle of Christmas. Allow it to get into your minds and you mull it over so that you can go deeper into what God really has done for us as it pertains to Christmas. And John does this for us in verse 14. So look at it with me, if you will. Again, the Bible says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. All right, so let's do a little Bible study on that verse and break some of these words down. You can see the term here, the word, in this verse. Now, what is the word? Well, the literal term for word from the Greek New Testament is the word logos, which means the message. Now, this is pretty awesome. This particular term is actually referencing the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the word that became flesh. He is the message that took on flesh. Now, this begs the question, where was Jesus before Bethlehem? Where was Jesus before he was born of Mary? Well, John also tells us that. He intros this entire chapter in verse 1 telling us where Jesus was. So look at it again. Remember, the word is Jesus, the message. John chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the word. Now think about this. What John is doing in the intro of John chapter 1 is he's actually kind of uh, taking Genesis 1 and morphing it into the gospel. In Genesis chapter 1, you have, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what John wants to do when he opens up his particular gospel is he wants you to think about Genesis 1. That's why he opens it, in the beginning. He wants our minds to go back to the very beginning of creation. And ultimately what John is doing here is he's saying as far back as your mind can possibly perceive the word, that is the Lord Jesus, was existing. Whenever your mind and my mind cannot go back any further, in other words, we can't think back to a later day, Jesus is still existing. You see, Jesus did not come into existence when he was born in Bethlehem. Jesus has always existed. He is eternal. He is without a beginning because he has always been. You know, it's pretty interesting. Every Christmas uh, since Krista and I had children, we would have a birthday party for Jesus. So we'd have a birthday cake. We'd put a happy birthday Jesus on it. And I remember Maddie again, who apparently has problems. But anyway, so she asked the question as we were decorating that particular cake, how many candles do we put on this, you know, this birthday cake? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? We don't have enough candles. What she was asking is, how old is Jesus? And I think oftentimes that question comes even to the adult mind. How old is Jesus? Well, Jesus has no age. Jesus is absolutely eternal. He has always existed. In fact, John goes on to note in verse 1, if you'll look at that again, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, this is pretty awesome because it magnifies a very special relationship of eternal fellowship within what is known as the Trinity. 
Now, the Trinity is the doctrine that teaches there's only one God who expresses himself in three persons. So you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So whenever John says here that the Word, that is Jesus, was being with God, it speaks of the fact that Jesus was actually in company with God the Father. This is a pretty awesome truth here. But just so you and I aren't confused about the nature of the Lord Jesus, John goes on and tells us in verse 1 again, and the Word was God. So think about it, right? Let me kind of read this to you, verse 1, using the name of Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. Now this is pretty awesome as you think about the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, that indeed he was God the Son. This verse lets us know as well where Jesus was before Bethlehem. Since Jesus Christ has always existed, he has always been in perfect fellowship with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. So you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in perfect community. And what's awesome here is that they are in conversation with one another in eternity. In fact, whenever you read Genesis, in the very first couple of chapters of Genesis, you'll hear that phrase, let us make man in our own image. Who's the us? Well, that's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit having a conversation. And God is actually creating humanity in his own image. So there's conversation. But what's unique as well about the Lord Jesus is that he not only was in conversation with the Father and the Spirit for all of eternity, but also we'll see here that he was involved in creation from the very beginning. Look again with me in John chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. The Bible says, He was in the beginning with God, that is Jesus. All things came into being through him. Again, that's Jesus. And apart from him, that's Jesus, nothing came into being that came into being. So what do we learn here from that verse? We learn that Jesus is actually the agent of creation. And looking back again at verse 14, I know I'm jumping around, but look at verse 14 again. The Bible says, and the word became flesh. That is, Jesus took on flesh. Now that is the miracle upon which you and I need to meditate. The eternal Jesus Christ, God the Son, who has always existed in perfect fellowship with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, one day took on human flesh. God the Son took on a physical body. Now, how can something like this occur? Well, this could only occur in such a way that is described as a miracle. And it had to occur through a miracle so that the Lord Jesus, God the Son, remained complete deity even in physical form. As a matter of fact, God is the only one who could have done this. So he chose to send the Lord Jesus Christ to enter the earth through a virgin named Mary. And because this was so out of the norm, uh, God had to send an angel to Mary's fiancé, Joseph. And you can imagine, right, if you're Joseph and all of a sudden you're engaged to Mary and she shows up with a baby bump, you're like, hold on, what's going down here? So the Bible says that Joseph actually was met one day by an angel. And the angel said to him in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And notice this, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Which, by the way, that word, that name, Jesus, is actually borrowed from the Old Testament name of Joshua. Joshua led the children of Israel towards the promised land. And Jesus is going to lead you and I to the eternal promised land. What a great picture that is. And not long after this, by the way, while Mary and Joseph were in Jerusalem, she indeed gave birth to Jesus. I want you to kind of meditate on this miracle for just a moment and think about it. Meditate on the fact that Jesus, who has always existed, who was in perfect fellowship with God the Father, Jesus who was God the Son, the agent of all of creation, now has been placed in the confines of a baby's body, held by a mere mortal named Mary, fully dependent upon her for his next meal. That's a phenomenal concept here. John MacArthur tells us, quote, the reality is surely the most profound ever because it indicates that the infinite became finite, the eternal was conformed to time, 
the invisible became visible, the supernatural, one reduced himself to the natural. In the incarnation, however, the word did not cease to be God, but became God in human flesh, undiminished deity in human form as a man. The Bible says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I love that little term, that word dwelt, because that word gives the imagery of pitching a tent, pitching a tent. Think about it, right? I've always loved the analogy because it reminds me of how God in the Old Testament used to meet his people in what was called the tent of meeting. So God pitched his tent among the people in the Old Testament in the tabernacle. That's where he was. You know, yesterday we were uh, at a wrestling tournament. And uh, while we were at the wrestling tournament, we take our kids uh, with us. And so, because I guess we need to, they're ours. But anyway, so we take our kids with us, but it, it's like an all-day event, right? So we have to figure out ways for them to be entertained. And so they bring their uh, hammocks, their e-news. They're really not e-news. Those things are too much money. But anyway, so we bring the cheap e-news, and we actually set them up. So they, they tie them up, and they get inside the hammock, and uh, they lay there, and people walk by, and they're, like, impressed that we came up with this idea. Our children get in the hammock. When Jesus was born in a manger, God the Son got in to flesh. He dwelt among us. That's the picture. He pitched his tent in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an awesome imagery. And here, John says, and we saw his glory. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to see the glory? It means to see his splendor. It means to be overwhelmed by his honor. And no doubt the Apostle John is highlighting the life of Jesus, including his miracles, his wisdom, his compassion, his death, as well as his resurrection, because John saw all of that. We beheld his glory. John goes on to say, Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That phrase, as of the only begotten, magnifies the uniqueness of Jesus. Indeed, there is no person to ever walk on the planet like the Lord Jesus Christ. He was unique, to say the least. Paul describes him in the New Testament as the image of the invisible God. The Hebrew author describes him as the exact representation of God. He was full of grace. Meaning he had the ability to display grace, not pour out wrath or judgment upon those who indeed deserved it, but instead he gave grace. But he also was full of truth. That means he had the ability to declare and teach and display what is right as well as what is wrong. In the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I have a full expression of who God truly is. If you want to know God, you come to Jesus. Jesus came to explain to us who he is. We meditate on that. What an awesome, phenomenal God you and I serve. So as I think about meditating on this, I, I thought about, okay, what are some, some practical steps we can do? All right, so let me just give you a few. You may want to jot these down. These aren't necessarily in your listening guide, but I want to encourage you this week, all right? So this is the week leading up to Christmas. We'll have our uh, Christmas celebration next Sunday uh, at 10 o'clock. But leading up to that, can I encourage you? Get along with the Lord. Listen, I know everything's pulling at your time just like it is mine. You've got a thousand places to be, a thousand things to do, a thousand things to get. But I want to encourage you to make sure that you set aside some time where you actually sit with the Lord Jesus. And just you with your Bible open, spending time meditating on what God has done so that you could know Him. Meditate on what God has done so that you could spend eternity with him. What an awesome truth this is. And what I give to you uh, this morning in your listening guide is actually scriptures you can read. One uh, per day leading up to Christmas. And so let me encourage you. Just get along with the Lord and really spend some time with him. Talking to him. Celebrating him. Thanking him. I even encourage you to write a letter to Jesus. You know, you think about a letter. Write it to Jesus. You're thinking about Christmas. You can... Write to him what makes you thankful about this past year. Say, Lord, Jesus, here's what I am overwhelmingly grateful for. You go a step further, you can write, Lord, here's what is drawing me to experience joy this year. This is what makes me hopeful. This is what drives me to worship. Lord, this is what excites me about this season. Write those things out. The reason I encourage you to do that is because oftentimes this is what I do, and it helps me concentrate. Whenever I write letters 
to the Lord or write out prayers to Jesus. It gives me the ability to focus in on what I'm saying. It's an awesome opportunity for you as well to meditate on this Christmas. And then I would encourage you to throw a Christmas party for Jesus. As a matter of fact, um, have a cake if you want to. We got a cake up here. We got a picture of that up there. Let's keep popping through it. Look at there. Who doesn't like cake? Amen. But you know what this does? This does for our family. It allows us to draw our attention back to what Christmas really is all about. Because like you, uh, you, you know, we're, we're in the same culture, right? And I know you guys probably think that, you know, I walk around with a collar on at the house and a Bible in my hand at all times. I don't do that. I hate to, you know, ruin your imagery of me. I walk around the house like you do, right? And I'm, I'm attracted by the same things that you're attracted by. So I have to, as the leader of the home, make an intentional step to make sure that we're focusing our attention on what Christmas is about so that my children are meditating on the reality and the miracle of Christmas. Don't miss that. Every man in the house, you're the spiritual leader of your home. If your family does not experience Christmas and squeeze the most out of it as they possibly can, that's because you didn't lead them to. So I would encourage you to figure out a way, and you don't have to use these, but use a way to make sure your family is focused on Christmas. You know, I, I always think about like uh, how this happened when I was growing up. I remember, you know, all of all the cousins would all end up at my granddad's house. Man, everybody's going in there, and we're opening up the presents and seeing what they are before we're supposed to. Y'all with me? So we fold them back up because we're expert at that, right? But I remember, man, my, my granddad would always come in, and before we would open up the presents, he would say, I'm going to read to you the Christmas story. And, and it wasn't elaborate. He wasn't a preacher, right? He just opened up his Bible, and he'd just read the Christmas story, and then he would pray for the family. And then we would dig into the gifts. But that small, tiny little step that my granddad took allowed me to realize he was leading our family to focus on what Christmas was about. Are y'all hearing me this morning? Don't miss that. Don't miss that opportunity. Now, i got to go quick. Let me give you step number two, all right? And that is I've got to make much of Jesus. Got to make much of Jesus. Look at verse 15. The Bible says here, uh, John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now, this is John the Apostle. Follow this. This is John the Apostle talking about John the Baptist. There are two different people, so don't get confused here. John the Baptist was set apart by the Lord to actually be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the imagery of a forerunner is a person who would go into town and clear out all of the streets of trash and debris because they knew a dignitary was about to come through. So John the Baptist came in, and he was preaching Jesus and saying, Repent of your sin and get ready for the dignitary who is the king. That's what he's doing. So he's preparing. He's the forerunner. He's making much of Jesus. As a matter of fact, interestingly, John the Baptist actually describes himself here in the text. He says, I was born six months before, or I'm sorry, uh, Jesus existed before me. But the interesting thing is that John the Baptist was actually born six months before Jesus. So what is John saying here? John is magnifying the eternal nature of Jesus. And then he makes that statement, which I love and I've kind of hung on to this Christmas season. He has a rank that is higher than I. So pointing to the eternal nature of Jesus is John the Baptist's way of letting others know that Jesus was God's son. And John the Baptist, by the way, had no problem drawing a crowd. Whenever he would get up to preach in the wilderness, hundreds of people went out to listen to him. And if he wasn't careful, he could get a big head and think he really had it going on. But instead, he constantly reminded people of Jesus. He reminded them that someone else was coming. In Matthew's gospel, he says, He who is coming after me is mightier than I. I'm not fit to remove his sandals. When he saw Jesus approaching him, he even shouted, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So his purpose was to tell everybody to get ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus. So he lived with great humility and he sought to make much of Jesus. And all of us can take to heart the statement of John the Baptist. We can say of Christ, his rank is higher than I. And whenever you think about Christmas, if you really want to squeeze the most out of Christmas, don't just lead your family to focus on Christmas. I want to challenge you over the next several days to tell somebody about Jesus. You want to squeeze the most out of Christmas? Talk about Jesus to those who don't 
know him. That's one thing I love about uh, this fellowship. It's a great desire to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Christmas production, you know what was happening there? Concord was squeezing the most out of Christmas that we possibly can. We not only sang about Jesus, but we also sang about the gospel, and we shared the good news of Jesus Christ. And there were somewhere around 20 decisions made for Christ. Yesterday, right here on our campus, our Hope Center, those who minister uh, in our community, helping those who need help, invited them to come for a breakfast with Santa. And they came in, they got gifts, but also the main attraction was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Had 15 people give their heart to Jesus yesterday. Amen. Awesome stuff there. And uh, really want to read you a, uh, a text that I received, or actually Krista received, and she sent it to me. Uh, sweet story from this morning to share with uh, Levi. A young man, probably 10 years old, this is a kid that was here yesterday, probably 10 years old, accepted Christ as his Savior. I asked if he understood the decision that he made, and he replied, yes. And I've always heard that Jesus died on the cross, but I never knew why. Now I do. It all makes sense to me now. The individual who sent the text said, I was crying as I was telling this. Awesome stuff. See, there are people who need to know Jesus. Many of you raise your hand. You're like, I know a family member. Why would you not squeeze the most out of Christmas this season and share the gospel with them? Why would you continue to walk by them when they're one breath away from hell and not share Jesus? Use that opportunity, man. It's a phenomenal time. I want to tell you a cool story. Y'all ready for it? Yeah? So uh, I've been discipling some guys for a while now down at Bluefin Grill in Gainesville. Best sushi in Gainesville. Y'all with me? But while we've been discipling them and uh, spending time together as a group of guys, we've been getting to know the people who work there. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the individual who was at our table began to share with us about how they were going to be having their Christmas party at Bluefin Grill today, which is the 18th, at 2 o'clock. And I said, no kidding, that sounds exciting. That sounds like a whole lot of fun. So then I just said, uh, who's going to share the Christmas story at the party? She said, what are you talking about? I said, well, who's going to show up and actually tell the Christmas story? I mean, tell everybody what Christmas is all about. She says, I don't know. So I said, let me. Are, are y'all with me? <laughs> We're aggressive like that, aren't we, David? So I said, let me. She said, well, I didn't, would you do that? Yeah, go find out if I can. She said, I'll have to ask the manager. I don't know if he'll let you. I said, well, go ask him. So she asked, and guess what? Today at 2 o'clock, Booyah. Are y'all listening? I'm not trying to get y'all to clap, but I appreciate you, buddy. You know what, I, you, you know what I'm doing? I, I want to squeeze the most out of Christmas I possibly can. Fifteen employees there, all unchurched. <laughs> they don't know. It's either going to be a revival or a riot. Are y'all listening? <laughs> I'm either going to get free sushi or chopsticks in the eyes. But anyway, so I, I'm pretty fired up about it. But this is, it. This is what, it, hey, by the, is Christmas about Jesus? Yeah, so get, quit getting all, you know, stressed about, out about gifts and you know, where you're going to be and all the plans. Stop doing that. Come back to uh, getting the most out of Christmas by meditating on what Jesus has done for you. And then also by sharing the story of Jesus. I guarantee you, if you do that this Christmas, it will change your whole Christmas season. Y'all listening? Don't miss that. Don't miss that opportunity. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you so much for who you are, what you've done for us, and Lord, how you uh, came to us in Jesus Christ, giving the very best gift to the planet, your son. And Lord, we thank you so much for how Jesus not only came, but lived a sinless life, and then he went to the cross at Calvary, and he did for us a miraculous thing. He died to pay for our sin. And Father, we thank you for not only his death, but also his resurrection. And with your heads bowed, your eyes closed this morning, listen, some of you are here today and you've never really given your heart to Jesus. You know, God created you to know him, but what separates you from the Lord is sin, just as it does myself. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's holy standard, his perfection. All of us are sinners. And so we can't even come into a relationship with the perfect God. But God, in his great love, sent his son Jesus on Christmas. And ultimately sent him to be a sacrifice for our sins. That's what happened on the cross. Jesus died in our place. He was buried and raised again. And when you turn from your sin and you place your trust in Jesus, the Bible says all of your sin is forgiven. And you're given a brand new life. 
And listen, I don't know what your background is or what's going on in your life, but if you've never made that decision for Jesus, the Bible says today's the day of salvation. You can make that decision this morning, and God will save you. Regardless of your background, regardless of what's going on, God loves you. God wants to have a relationship with you. So if you need to give your heart to Jesus this morning, would you just pray something like this in your heart as I pray out loud? Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Just tell him. Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner, and there's nothing I can do to get rid of my sin. I'm not good enough. I'm not religious enough. But today I want to say thank you for Jesus who came and ultimately died on the cross for me to pay the penalty of my sin. Thank you, Lord, not only for the death, but also the resurrection. And today I'm turning from my sin and placing my trust in Jesus. And with your heads bowed, your eyes closed this morning, and listen, if that's the prayer of your heart, the first step of obedience is baptism. You saw that this morning in Melody's life as she was baptized. She's just going public with her faith, and we'd love to give an opportunity for you who responded to Jesus this morning to go public with yours in the days ahead. So if you've given your heart to Christ, in a moment we'll stand to our feet, we'll start singing. As we do, we'll have an invitation. So I'm just going to invite you to come forward. I'll be here in the front, others as well. We want to pray for you, help you along in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Or God may be calling you to join this church body. If that's the case, you'd be obedient to the Lord this morning. But most of all, let me just encourage all of you who know the Lord. Get the most out of this Christmas season. Meditate on the miracle of his birth and make much of Jesus. Christmas is not about you. It's about our Savior. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Speak to hearts. Give people courage to come forward who've responded to you by faith. Also give those courage to come forward who perhaps need to join this fellowship and get involved with what God's doing here, and we'll give you glory for him. Father, at the same time, we pray this morning. We know we've got a lot of folks traveling this weekend. So we just want to ask, Lord, that you would give them not only safety, but also you give them open doors of opportunity for the gospel. And we'll give you glory for it. And that's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. While we sing, you come this morning if God's calling you.